Hello, welcome to today's webcast on API design and adoption-centered approach. We are your hosts today. I'm Brian Malloy. You can find me on Twitter at Landlessness. And I'm Marsh Gardner. You can find me at Earth Marsh on Twitter. Looking very preppy there, Marsh. Photo. Uh, I, I dressed down today just okay. to compensate. Yeah, fantastic. A few things we'd like to tell you about. We have a fantastic conference. This is the second annual I Love API conference. It's happening September 8th through 10th at Fort Mason in San Francisco, right on the water. It's a beautiful setting, and we'll have a lot of great API and digital business content. As always, we suggest that you join our Google group called API Craft. A lot of fantastic discussion around API design and API implementation thinking. We also have a fantastic channel on YouTube, youtube.com slash Apogee, where this webcast and all the previous and future webcasts that we've done will be published. And the slides for today's show and shows like today's show will be available on SlideShare. Let's get into it, Marsh. Cool. So we've done these API design webcasts from time to time, and each time we add a little bit to it. If you've seen them in the past, hopefully we're bringing you something new today as well. But before we get too far into this, I want to talk about one of my absolute favorite APIs. It's Integers as a Service, and as far as I know, it's Brooklyn Integers was the first version of this. Um, this is an API unlike most APIs, uh, and they don't have an API design problem. They're one of the rare ones. So I think it would be uh, making a big thing to, to say that they've got a, a, an interesting business model because essentially their API is, is, a, is a joke for API folks, right? They have, you, know, you can get these bespoke integers via API from Brooklyn integers. Um, and they were so successful that we quickly saw mission integers spring up, London integers, and the uh, off-brand Canal Street integers as a service. But the reason they don't have an API design problem is because you know, their, their APIs are built not to be used, but to be funny, right? Um, and everybody else has an API adoption problem, right? So no one cares uh, really if Brooklyn Integers gets used, but every other API has been built so that people come and take advantage of it. That's why it's a service, right? And so uh, the moment your API goes into production, you have an adoption problem. Uh, and that's what we're gonna talk about today is how do you use principles like obviousness to make your APIs more adoptable, to make them more obvious, uh, and that will help with your adoption problem, which everybody has. Fantastic. So just a quick overview of what the talk's gonna be. I'm gonna quickly set the stage for how we got to where we are, and then talk about what that is, where we're we going, and how are we gonna get there. And then we'll make sure we have some time at the end for questions. So first, how do we get here? Going way, way back. We talk about web services. Web services obviously grew out of the web. And so in the beginning, 1991, this is the screenshot from the original HTTP, HTTP documents. And it's important to think about web services. You know, back then, there were really two verbs, right? There were get, which is the default in a browser when you enter a, an address. And then there was post, which was how you would push data back to the server. That's how when you fill out a form, that data would be sent back. And so those were the two verbs that really began uh, the web. And so since then, uh, we've seen, for instance, the rise of SOAP and XML RPC. They came about around the same time. This was the rise of XML. It was the beginning of separating this content from the presentation. And it, it was pretty powerful, but uh, you know, obviously we've moved beyond that for lots of reasons. Um, one reason is that it wasn't really leveraging all the strengths of HTTP. So there was essentially one resource and one verb. You would post your data always. It, and so though, you know, beyond that, we, that set the stage for this idea of REST. And so way back in 2000, think about that, it's 14 years ago, Fielding's now famous dissertation on REST, which has a lot of really amazingly prescient ideas, particularly when you consider what's come about since then. One of the great insights that Fielding had was that HTTP was a really fantastic pattern, and that, that was the reason why the web was so successful. Uh, and so REST drew upon that strength didn't require the HTTP transport the APIs necessarily, but it was an insight into how to make these APIs more obvious and more usable. Yep. You know, one thing to note here is when Fielding wrote this dissertation, we had zero web APIs in the world, and the, thing, the, the dissertation was not about APIs at all. It was about user interfaces. And so this notion of REST API is actually where, uh, more recently, we've just, we just try to find 
some term to bring us away from the soap tyranny and rest was used because it was such a powerful dissertation. But oftentimes people get wrapped around the axle like trying to find API wisdom inside of that dissertation. If you read the whole thing, it's just not there. He very slightly hints a little bit about sort of syndicated content and how web crawlers work. Uh, but even then they were crawling UI, right. even though the UI wasn't shown to a person. Uh, so if, in terms of a, a note of caution, if you're looking at that dissertation, keep in mind he was describing for, a PhD, for his PhD the UI web, and the API web was a long way in the future still. Right, and I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. So, you know, think about all of the things that have come about since that dissertation, right? So software as a service has seen its rise. Web mashups, remember them? Yeah. They were a big deal back in the day. Virtualization, like the idea of Amazon Web Services. User experience as a discipline that was came about a, a large part because of mobile and the sort of new human computer interface that we had. And then mobile has been a tremendous pressure on APIs in general. And all of these things have come about since the rest of dissertation. And for, for those of us that have been around for a while, when the first serious web mashup started showing up, it was usually like Flickr and something else or Google Maps with some data on top of it. And those of us that have been in the service-oriented architecture business for a while, it was just like a palm to the forehead where you're like, oh my gosh, all that stuff that we've been talking about, selling these really big Java, UDDI implementations for SOA mashups, really had very little fruition from it. But then on the other hand, the web guys were just like cranking ahead, doing the cool mashups that we were, that we were selling and talking about. And I think that just speaks to the power of how the HTTP web mashup won. And that's, I think everything we're doing is actually that is a very important like epoch moment for the yes. era that we're currently in. And it's also you know, a big point in time because uh, it got us away from XML, right? When you had XML, you had to parse that in the browser. And now with the rise of JSON, mm -hmm. you had this JavaScript object notation that was native to the browser. Yeah. And so there was no parsing hit in the same way. Um, yeah, so, so a whole new class of developers were able to be productive with yeah. those APIs. And then since, really since the iPhone, we've seen the rise of app and the decline of web. And I don't think web's going anywhere anytime soon. Mm -hmm. It's going to be there for a while, but you know, it's interesting to look at the trends and see you know, how have these words in, in a Google trend compared over time. And, and really, apps have already won. It's, it's clear, we've seen it in, in the data in lots of ways, right? They, there's more mobile traffic now happening than web traffic. That's a big deal. So the, the, just that, that chart is showing Google search? Right, so this is a, a Google Trends uh, compar comparison with a search term for web versus app. Yeah. Now is that perfect? No, but it, it does. It, it's very illustrative of the trends, and that's Proxy, a, sure. as much as uh, important as any. And then you know, this is a this is a screenshot from one of my favorite video games, Civilization, and it had this idea about it that technologies beget technologies. That you need to that they they tend that innovation drives more innovation, right? And so if you think about what's happened in the last 14 years since the rest dissertation, you know that what has that enabled and unlocked? Another interesting thing is that we've seen these dual revolutions in computing with virtualization and with mobile over the last, what, seven years or so. Um, you know, every time there is a revolution in computing, it tends to be roughly 10 times the size of the previous one. So apps will be 10 times bigger than the web, roughly. And what comes after that, whether that's Internet of Things, you know, it looks like it, maybe uh, 10 times that or 100 times the previous generation. So that's how we got to where we are. So where are we now, right? So you always run the risk of this high architecture, designing structures, forgetting that people need to live in them. And it's important to remember that these services all work because people care about them and use them, right? And, and the people who are working with the APIs, those are developers, they're people too. Uh, and so you run the risk of designing these beautiful structures and forgetting how to make them usable and livable, right? And so, uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back to this in a few slides, but really this is you know, thinking carefully about architecture because that's what REST is, it's an architectural style. Um, and you could be, it, architecture means lots of things. And so just be considerate not to embrace it because it's REST necessarily, but look for the patterns that make it good. So we've done a lot of webinars and created a lot of eBooks and materials to try to help tell the story of API design. You can get a lot of these on our website. This is. The, as I said at the beginning, revisiting this we, over time, every time it gets a little better. And I think we have a new way of expressing what it is that makes a, this particular philosophy of API design work. API design brings out passion and controversy all the time. You don't have to go very far. The API craft Google group, these are three screenshots from that. I mean, they're really like one true media type. That was a mm -hmm. epic thread. Mm -hmm.
there's no shortage of passion around this. So the approach that we've been sort of carrying the flag on is this sort of pragmatic approach where you just look around and you just observe how web APIs were working from the likes of Twitter and Google and Amazon and others and said, you know what, it's interesting that none of these mainstream APIs use hypermedia, so what's going on with that? So there are two strong schools of thought around web API design. There are folks who are in the sort of this pragmatic camp and there are folks who are in the hypermedia camp. I've come around a long way on this, like 180 degrees in my thinking, and I, I, I'm convinced now that sometimes the right API design is hypermedia, and it's a matter of having the right tool for the job. So for example, in, in one of the Apogee labs here, we do a lot of stuff around the Internet of Things, and all of the stuff that we're doing around our API design is driven off of hypermedia. In fact, we use the Siren hypermedia standard. And what I think the, one of the key things we had to say, okay, when do I use like this kind of a simpler API design, and when do I use hypermedia? I think it comes back to the Hadios constraint, which is, is the hypermedia the engine of application state? If you're talking about building a mobile app or some kind of typical UI consumer of an API, chances are that the client, the device app, wants to be the engine of application state. And that's kind of an indicator for me that you want to use the simpler pragmatic API approach. In the case of Internet of Things, there usually isn't a user interface involved at the API level. It's machines to machines talking with each other. You know, that your thermostat is going to send a message to an actuator, which is the furnace, or uh, you're going to have your um, factory automation, robotic arms talking to the biometrics on the factory worker and things like that. And th in that case, you don't need user interfaces, and that's where hypermedia really, really shows its value. But the key point here is when we're talking about this RV, think of it as one of many tools to put in your API design toolbox. And uh, there's a little bit of a commercial here. Coming up this summer, the end of the July, we're having an in real life version of the API craft group. We're getting together. This is the second time we're doing this. And it's a big unconference. So second and third day, we just get together in a room and we propose agenda topics and whatever sort of emerges as the conference becomes the conference. But this year, we're adding a very special session called a hyper hypermedia panel and hackathon. And we're delighted that the six leading hypermedia standards will be represented by the authors of those standards. So Micah Mudson with Collection JSON and Uber, Mike Kelly with How, Marcus Landfaller with Hydra, Steve Klabnik with JSON API, Jorn Wilt with Mason, and Kevin Swire with Siren. They're all going to be in one room duking it out about what hypermedia uh, approach is the best. So there are, so there are some spots left open. We're, we limited just 100 people, keep it kind of small and intimate. So I highly suggest you go over to api-craft.org and register for a spot there because that hypermedia panel followed by the on conference is going to be just fantastic. And where is the conference going to be held? It's going to be in Detroit. Detroit, where it was last year. Yeah, excellent. Which is actually where Sid Myers is from, your favorite game maker. Oh, yeah. Detroit. Excellent. Yeah. I met him once. Actually. Good guy. Yeah. I, yeah, I was very flowing and clattering about all the great things he'd done. I'm sure he was impressed. <laughs> and then one more thing of interest. If, the, if you're really into API design topics, we are putting together an API design course. It will cover this style, this pragmatic approach, as well as the hypermedia approaches. That should be in late June, early July. Look for that coming soon. All right, so back to this slide. So we wanted to what are we looking get at back That's to our roots. So, yeah, so it's a Geary building, left. Yeah, which is beautiful. I mean, they're amazing buildings, and you should go look at them uh, if you have a chance. They're worth going out of your way for. And then on the right, we have the Winnebago, right? So Winnebago is mobile ready. It's got wheels. <laughs> it's very practical, and you don't need a lot to live in it. It's pretty comfortable and very flexible. So um, out of that grew this idea of resource verb. So, you can see it's an homage to the Winnebago logo, but this is this is the simplest way to think about these kinds of pragmatic API design problems. They really it plays on the strengths of what makes the web work, and that's a resource and a verb. That's not everything. It doesn't. It, you're not done there, right? Mm -hmm. it, but it gives you this idea that some things are more obvious than others, and it, be, be careful to apply that principle of obviousness as you work through API design issues. At its base. You have the resource. A resource is like a noun. It's a thing that lives somewhere. And we're, we're used to these all the time, right? So we, we understand that people are bad at the kinds of addresses that machines use, right? So google.com lives at 173. I'm not going to read the whole thing. That's mm -hmm. a lot of numbers. And it's hard, right? Yeah. Because it's just not human friendly. I wouldn't recognize that as being Google. In the same way, I wouldn't recognize my own Twitter ID, right? That's, uh, it's important for machines. But then we add this layer on top for people because people are good with names and words, right? So when you, when you put those together, for instance, Apogee, our GitHub presence, it's got an address. When you look at that, you know what it means. You just understand. And so those are the things. That's what resources are. Everybody knows how to use them. My mother understands that when she puts an address into her web browser, it's taking her somewhere to a thing, right? She's going to get something back from it. 
And so that's really powerful. Every, it's a least common denominator of, of web services, right? And then... But we, if you should note, out, note right yeah. there in terms of contrasting with like some hypermedia thinking, hypermedia thinking would, just, would actually swap that around, right? Where the idea is you really, the machine shouldn't really care what the address is because it's all discoverable in, in band of each of your API requests. Yes. And that's, again, I think one of the key distinctions between the RV approach is really good when you understand that between your API and the end value, there is a developer and a design team that's using that stuff. So it's important for the human to understand it. Whereas in the hypermedia world, you've got one machine talking to another, it really isn't so important that there's uh, human readable stuff in there. Except the, the machines still don't know how to program themselves yet, right? Not until we get Skynet, <laughs> right? And so the- Actually, there's some guys from Bechtel working on a project. That is Skynet. true, there is, there is <laughs> actually, that's good stuff. Um, well, I'll tell you things. When we, when we, the stuff that we do in the lab, uh, Frankly, we don't we don't look at the API requests right. because you, you you build a client that is smart enough to understand the responses and you let it go. So there is some. But you still don't know what to do with it, right? So you're going to get back a photo. You have to decide how you're going to display it. It's not like you're done, right? Mm -hmm. You don't get to forget about it. You have to think a little bit about what the data is coming back. But it, at least in the case you made earlier, if people aren't using the interface, there's less of that need, right? So, yes. um, so it's different. But it's still people are still writing code to make stuff go. But anyway, yeah. um, I'm Russell. Arm muscle, yeah, we, okay. this is good. Look for, we'll have more of this at, uh, in Detroit. Okay. So we've got the we've got the resource, and then we've got the verb. These are the two key things, right? So you have the things, the nouns, the resources, and then you want to do stuff to them, right? And so there's lots of this history in computing. Just to touch on one, like how you do queries of a database, SQL being the most famous. You have CRUD, standard CRUD, and that loosely maps onto the HTTP verbs that we have. And there are more HTTP verbs, but these are the main ones, right? And so you have a thing, your resource, and you can do stuff to that thing. You can delete it, you can retrieve it, you can create another thing, and you can update it. Mm -hmm. And that, from that, that's your basic palette. Now you've got the, the tools you need to start building out and planning your API. Yeah, this way we, we, we have a website up called API Atlas, where people can vote on which parts of the HTTP mm -hmm. spec they use for APIs. And we, we didn't put very good analytics on it, so the way that we know how many votes have been taken is we just look at get. Yeah, because everybody uses get, <laughs> and then secondarily post. So it's interesting to see how you talked at the beginning the history of HTTP. Get and post were the first two for really good reasons. They just do a lot of the heavy lifting, and then the others help complement it. And then the ones aren't on that list really are the long tail of what people use. Let's take that very basic building block, the resource and the verb, and start applying it. Right? So Stripe has a really good example of this, right? So we we believe we've talked about this a lot before that. You know, think about a really good way to think about these things is that there are groups of things, those are collections, and that there are those things themselves, right? Those are entities in that collection. And so Stripe, you can look at their API design, you can see that ignore the first path piece, the version for a second, we'll come to versioning in a minute, always contentious, but charges. So they've got charges as a collection, they've got coupons, they've got customers. And so they can post to any of those collections and create an entity, and that's the charge ID, the coupon ID, and the customer ID. It's a really simple and very obvious pattern. You know how to work with it. You know that creating a coupon, you post, and you'll get back an ID. So then, you know, versions, you saw that V1 in the Stripe API. There are lots of ways to do this. The problem with some of these, for instance, like Twilio, is that when you look at the Twilio API and you see 2010, it feels pretty old now in 2014, right? That's good, it might, that's not a bad thing necessarily, at least it's stable, right? But at the same time, it's pushed all of the really meaningful characters off to the right further. So is there a way they could have been more succinct in that? Um, and then we'll come to Salesforce, who right in the middle, the third level of the hierarchy, and, and, and really I think about these as, you know, as their directory structure, right? It, it, that, when you work with the file system, each of those slashes is a directory. And so we're at the third level here, and it's version 29.0. So Salesforce has this pattern of updating their API every six months. And so they're just on a force march with that. I, I'm not a big fan of having a dot in your version. I think versioning is a scary big thing. It means you're breaking stuff, right? And when you break stuff, you should be thoughtful, you know, to avoid it at all costs if you can. Uh, and so having minor iterations of your API, I, I don't see the point in it. I think um, just, you know, you, I would have been happy if I were Salesforce to stop at 29. <laughs> Every six months have, you know, add it by one if that's the cadence they're gonna work on. And then Foursquare has the version right in the first level of hierarchy, very simple V2. It's just clean and, and obvious. Things you don't want to do are pass in a version in a header or pass in a version in the query string, just because they're easy to miss. If they're important and they they determine 
you know, what version of the, res of the representation you're going to get, then lead with it. So we tend to, when talking about things from an RV perspective and you know, obviousness, very pragmatic, uh, put the version up close in the front there um, with that V2. So Twi no, Twitter actually has a, they didn't put a V, they, but they're on their second version of their API. And they went from 1.0 to 1.1. I mean, personally, I would have saved two characters. And gone V2. And, and gone V2, or even just two. Yeah, like, sure. It's obvious enough to me. But. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So just to be clear, like we, in this approach we're talking about here, versioning is one of the big areas of contention where a lot of people, for good reasons, really awesome reasons, will advocate that you do want to put the version number in the header because it, there's a whole bunch of benefits sure. about not having to rewrite URLs every time you get a response back from systematic, you know, where there's dependency across different API requests. And Marsh and I, as we're advocating IB, we're fully aware of those use cases and why they're really important to put the, the version number in the header. However, what we're advocating here for intellectual consistency, consistency around RB is to put it in the URL, URL anyway because it's all about making the developer productive and making obvious affordances for the developer in the design. And I think there's another a key piece of that, which is that ideally you should be able to get responses from an API in the browser. Hack the browser. And if you have to edit the header, that's not going to happen, right? You have to use a browser extension, some sort of add-on in order to be able to do that. Which isn't the end of the world, but yeah, um, but it's an extra thing. But then, but then you you could, you know, if, if your version's required, what now? What do you do? You know, having good defaults is smart, but uh, you know, it, being explicit isn't bad. Uh, it's not a bad declaration to say, you know, this is stable. We're calling it V1. Uh, it's going to be there for a while. Now, Yuri is asking, shouldn't a resource be available for more than one version? The quick answer is yes, but there's a, the more complicated answer is how you want to think about deprecating old versions and you know supporting them for how long. Ideally, you can't you can't it can't be binary. You can't say up until this millisecond we supported V1, and from this millisecond forward we're supporting only V2. You can't do that. Oh yeah, well because your developers you need, need a little time. Yeah, they need to, overlap to, 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 to adjust. Update, right? So there's definitely you have to build in some kind of deprecation period. Oftentimes that's limited by how much extra work you're ready to take on the database side. It's almost always the data store that is going to yeah. clog the works in terms of handling the versioning. But yeah, they should be available at both multiple versions at one time. For you know, until, you have, until you have a clear period of time by which everyone needs to react. Right. So here, here's an example. I knew what happened. Giuseppe just said he's claiming, asserting very strongly that putting the version in the URL is an anti-pattern and that it should go in the header. I mean, that, the, I think that what I said earlier, the idea that you should be able to browse it from a web browser is, is one of the great reasons why that's not true. Like you okay. should be able to see right. uh, and understand what the response is without having to get too fancy. Well, you, you were such a big fan of using all the, all the HTTP stuff. HTTP has this design into it where the version is meant to go on a header mark. Sure, but at the same time, there's this degree of obviousness, right? The, the things that you know how to access, the, the, the resource and the verb, and, and the browser's defaulting to the get. Really, and so it, again, you can't use the browser to update easily mm -hmm. a collection, but at least you can query it, and that's the that's like the entry point. That's the easiest, safest thing to do, is to not change the server state, to just hit a resource and see what you get back. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it's nice to be able to do that on different versions of that API and see what's coming back. You know, if you're looking at so definitely, you brought up a great point. The deprecation uh, once you introduce versioning, deprecation is an issue. No one's done this better than Twitter, I think, in terms of figuring out how to give clearly, uh, communicate a window to their developers, and then slowly throttle. Like the thing that I loved about the way they deprecated their API, their V1 API, is that like two weeks before, they started just for 10 minute periods turning off the V0, the version one of their API. <laughs> and you know, that, they, they had spikes of errors. And one that told them how many people, I mean, I'm sure they have metrics around it in general, but it, it sent a little warning like, hey guys, you realize this is going away, you need to do something. Right. And then, you know, over time, I, I would expect that every time they did that up into the day, you know, there were fewer and fewer of those errors. That's clever. So Twitter, Twitter did a nice job with it. Good. All right. But again, sure. you know, versioning, we're we could probably that spend the, the entire thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We could probably talk so, about versioning. So let's, let's pause here. Our overall point is we understand that there are other ways to do versioning. And yes. we actually have you know, one of our colleagues, Kevin, he has versioning oh, done yeah. a totally different way. And we understand why it's there. And we think there are fantastic systems of thought that would say that the URL containing the version is an anti-pattern. Yes. What we're saying though is another approach, which is a completely different yet self-consistent 
intellectually in sound framework is what we're advocating here, and you would put versioning in the yes. URL. There, there, you know, it's like religion. There are many ways to the top of the mountain, right? And you have to pick the way that's right for you. Great. And uh, I mean, people do get religious about versions. Right? Let's talk about politics now. Let's talk about politics next. Yeah, let's, let's, we'll be sure to offend nobody that way. All right, let's go. <laughs> that's good. All right. Uh, yeah. So next slide. All right. So query moving along. So the query parameters are a way in which to affect the representation that you're getting back somewhat, right? So in this case, Twitter, when you want to make a search of the Twitter space, you know, there you're searching tweets and you're passing in that query in the string, right? In the query string, and you can see the result type recent, right? So this this allows you to get a list of the tweets collection with a keyword and to affect the ordering that comes back, right? So query parameters are a great way to affect the response you're going to get. And you used to say, you know, query, use the query string to sweep that complexity under the rug. Yep. And then, so, you know, as we're layering in the various things we can work with, remember, we had resource first, then the verb, the query string, because it's really technically part of the resource, but that's the subtle way to affect what you're getting back. And then there are the header parameters, and these are less visible, right? So again, RV is pragmatic. It, it cares about obviousness. Some things are more obvious than others. Things that are in the resource are obvious because they're, they're what you see in the address bar, right? Uh, and then what comes, what you do in the headers are a great way to affect the message, right? So it's a great way to pass things about the message, whether it's e-tags, so you can deal with mm -hmm. you know, understanding caches, whether it's authentication. Those aren't things that necessarily affect the message. They're just about the sending of the message. So use the header to put things like that in there that will affect what you're getting at. Real quick, because uh, I said that's coming from Facebook. If you want to spend some time understanding contrast between, say, clearly identifying the resource and the mm -hmm. URL patterns that we talked about and what it would look like to not do that, go hang out on the Facebook Graph API. Yeah. Because it's a really well-designed API, but for, for them, they don't, for many of the objects in the Facebook system, there is no sense of saying, okay, show me all the people, show me all the pages. These things are all just objects. The, yes. ID, the identifier tells you Baked into that identifier, which is completely opaque, is yes. what type of object it is, because they have a truly universal, unique uh, ID space. Yes. And it's really clever, and it solves a lot of problems from Facebook's perspective in terms of, you know, hey, pages look a lot like, you know, users in terms of the features and the capabilities that are there. But as a developer approaching for the first time, it's it's a real. It takes a, it's a struggle to know exactly. You look at you know a sure. request, and you you have no idea what kind of object you're getting back yep. beforehand. So it, I think that was really good for solving some Facebook problems, but maybe they could have taken some extra steps to make it uh, better for the developer. I agree. They could have considered a layer on top of it, but you know at the same time I agree. They, it was when they launched their Graph API, it was a beautiful thing. Like they'd Absolutely. done some deep thinking and understood yes. their system and how it worked. Um, it was a revelation. It's still a top 10 oh, API. Yeah. It's I mean, wonderful. Yeah. It's, yeah, and they understood the social graph and how that mapped onto their yeah. entity, you know, the entities in their system, and, and then they used that to expose their API. Very clever. Um, Just a great example of a, a, another pattern. I know another great pattern that comes from Facebook, and it's in part to address what you just talked about, is the idea of these, these conveniences, these shortcuts. Like, it's, again, it's difficult to remember the ID of a user. It's not a human-friendly thing. So what can you do to make that easy for developers, the people who are using your API in code, right? The slash me is fabulous. If you just attach your authentic, your authorization token, your access token from OAuth2, then, and you hit slash me, you get back the information for that user, right? Very clever. LinkedIn is a similar thing. Uh, their pattern was derived from the idea that, you know, slash, the Linux. So tilde slash is Linux, yes. The Linux is awesome, which it is. But, you know, seeing a tilde in a URI just, it is for developers. Yeah, and it is for developers. But they're so, Windows developers too. And and it says something about their personality and their style, which yeah. I like. Yeah. But I find the me to be more obvious. And then things like Foursquare recent check-ins. I mean, they, they realized that enough people were trying to get at the recent check-ins right. that they made a short right. to it. Right. They were querying like order, date, ascending, descending, right. and limit, and instead just made it really simple. Yeah, yeah. it's really nice. So uh, you know, it's a great, that's like the extra level to add on top is how can you, and again, it's how can you make this easier for the people who use your API developers. Speaking of layers on top, are we going to talk about Dan Jacobson's orchestration stuff? Please? I don't know that we will, but okay. we'll, we'll come back to it. Okay, cool. All right, formats. Uh, generally today, good news is that a lot has changed in the four years since we started talking about Pragmatic REST. Yeah. You know, really JSON first has come about. So if you look at SoundCloud, you know, they came about at a time when JSON was not the obvious choice anymore. Right. It was not yet the obvious choice. And so they had to deal with how do you represent formats. They picked a pattern that's pretty obvious for people who work with computers, file extensions, put a dot and a file type on the end. But you can see also something interesting here, which is that their default was XML. That's how old their API is. 
That tells you something. You know, I expect to see them deprecate XML sometime in the near future. And there, it, it's a burden over time to maintain both. So if you can get away with just JSON, do it. It's great. If you have to, um, you can certainly use an accept header and let the client say what format it wants back. But now you've again made it harder to access those resources in the format that you want via the browser. So in terms of obviousness, it's not terrible. It's not a huge mistake to put it in the URL, but it's also perfectly good to put it in the header if, if you like. And if you can, stick with just JSON. Uh, you know, really, I would say RV and Pragmatic REST, the, the various and the web, you know, designing web services ebooks that we've done in the past, they're really a, they're a keep it simple, stupid approach to API design. Like, you know, think about, don't overcomplicate it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think RV is just a, uh, a better way to think about those things in terms of elevating the resource and the verb to the, to the level you know, that they deserve to be because of their obvious nature. You know, just to close out on formats for a second. So, you know, Will Norris put it best, I think he's at Google. XML versus JSON for APIs boils down to the idea that JSON makes it much easier to accidentally do the right thing. I think that's totally true. It also, uh, you know, in terms of not having to parse data, if you're building a web client or any sort of service that, uh, on the web that's going to interact with your API, that you know JSON is the right choice. Sometimes you will run into patterns that aren't that don't well map onto the various verbs in the HTTP palette. This is going to happen. In fact, any of the APIs where you can have a search, any of the services like Twitter or Facebook, you know, it's nice to have a search resource, but search is a verb. There are times where you know generally you should avoid putting verbs in your nouns, right? Because that's what a resource is, is a noun. <laughs> Um, but there's sometimes where it just makes it clear, and so it's not terrible to do it. But just like good artists know when to break the rules, do it only when you have to. Right? Um, another good example is uh, you know if you're trying to convert, if you had an API that converted currency, uh, there isn't really uh, any sense to doing that as a post. You're not changing a server state, but you need a way in which to ha do this verby thing mm -hmm. in this nouning thing, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that, but you know, I think a really a gr great example is DigitalOcean. Uh, you know, they have long-running processes. When you've got a droplet, when you've got an instance running in DigitalOcean and you need to reboot it, that's a verb, and it's not terrible to put it there. Uh, so use actions in your URL if you have to. Uh, it's not terrible, but avoid it if you can, without torturing yourself. Absolutely. Auth. Auth. So OAuth2 is most definitely the preferred authentication mechanism of modern APIs. It has lots of flows for lots of different use cases. Find the one that fits you. There are still some times, particularly in the enterprise, well, where we see people who want to use OAuth 1.0a. If you want to be sure, if you want some message integrity, and you want to know that the message hasn't been tampered with, that is a reason to use OAuth 1. It's not a bad choice, but again, OAuth 2 is, uh, is a lot easier to work with for people. You don't have to sign every request. And so you can get your token, you do, your, you do your, uh, you know, your dance, you get your token, and then you sign all your requests with it. That's easier for developers to work with. But if you have to deal with signing requests in OAuth 1.0a, you know, that's hard. It's not fun. It's a great comment from JC. Yeah. No, no, it's, uh, so many, the comment, <laughs> I find it funny that OAuth 2 was mentioned in a talk called Adoption Centric. So it's Amen. a great point. Yes, it yeah. is. And part of the reason why is that it's important to have standards, right? Consistent standards are super important. Um, OAuth 2 is the right way, it's like a valet key, right? It's a, it's a way in which to let, particularly with third-party apps, to let uh, those semi-trusted applications run on your behalf. Yeah. And so, as uh, authentication does suck, no way around it, yeah. but it's a... Uh, there are parts of OAuth that are inherently complex because it's a complex problem. Yeah. The reason that we advocate for it for, is really actually pretty simple. It's almost like a Britney Spears problem. Like she's popular because she's popular. Yep. Right. OAuth is at this point it's popular because it's popular, and frankly, and sadly, that's good enough. Yeah. Well, but oh, so he makes a good point. So JC then add, followed it up with saying that it, it's uh, nothing against OAuth two. It's the right thing for production. That's absolutely right. It yeah. is the exact perfect authentication scheme for production, yeah. but it's, it's terrible, terrible for dev. Yeah. And and that plays right into this slide. I my favorite service handling the authentication problem is GitHub. They do a great job with this because they say. Look, you should be using OAuth, but we're not going to make you do that because they understand that people are going to—they're going to be first-time API users of mm -hmm. the GitHub API, yep. and so they let you use basic authentication. They even have a mechanism to use that with two-factor authentication. That's a nice trick, um, which you should turn on if you haven't, because by the way, it's—it's it's great that they enabled that. Cool. Um, and then they also have an API key. Like they basically say, 
Use the auth that's going to make it easier for you, but you should be using this for production. If you're going to use this in production, you should be using a auth. Okay. If we map this back to RV first principles, our first level of advocation is always provide just one way of doing something. Yes. The, the anti-pattern of that is what you yes. see at Foursquare, right? They let you, or going back to um, how they do the format, right? You can either specify the format in the UL, URL, or you can specify it in the okay. header. And because of the way HTTP works, you can actually send both. Sure. Right. So they have a little asterisk in the documentation that says, if you send us both, we'll you put XML one. in one and JSON in the other, we're going to choose this one. Yeah. And that's where you're going to get back. So it's very confusing. They don't say which one they would prefer that you use. So that's a really bad pattern. I think what GitHub has accomplished here is they say, we really want you to do this one way. This, one way. this is the way we vastly produce a whole paragraph on why we think you should use OAuth. Yeah, yeah. But if you don't, here are the other ways to do it. And I think in terms of a compromise on the design philosophy, that's a pretty good one. If you have to provide multiple ways of doing something, first of all, don't. But if you have to, then be very, very clear and outspoken about which one is the one that you prefer. Yes. And another great example is that if I want to write a script for my own personal use to get at my data, I'm not planning on building an app for anybody else, then OAuth 2 is overkill. Right? I, I just yeah. want to write a simple quick script. All that does is slow me down. And, and maybe I even share my script out there on the web, but it lets people deal with it on their own terms. Right? Think carefully about authentication. It, there are times where you should have more than one kind of auth. Mm -hmm. This is one of those great violations of the principle you stated. Yep. Dates. So let's we'll start at the bottom and work up since we just <laughs> left Foursquare. The Foursquare uses epoch time. And epoch time is nice because you know, it just counts milliseconds from 1970. And so they sort really easily because they're numbers and they just keep going up. But there some I've known people who can look at epoch time and do the math in their head and have a sense of when that, uh, like I don't know when that date is from. Probably tell you something about this slide when I created this slide originally, if we went back and look at it. But you know there are easier ways. Epoch isn't, isn't bad, but it's not very human friendly. So then we'll jump up to Twitter here at the top Twitter is their own time format. I don't recognize that time format, but I just I find it difficult to work with. It's probably because they, Twitter was so early that they settled on that format to begin with. But Bing, I'm gonna call Bing out here as the one that does it right. There's an ISO 8601. There's an actual spec that uh, that's standard for dealing with dates and times. The beauty of it is it's this perfect marriage of something that machines can sort and know easily which is newer or older, um, but that doesn't lose the sort of readability that people need to be able to work with the dates. So, you know, it's not wrong to use epoch time for sure, but in terms of thinking about what's easier for the developers who are working with your API or trying to understand things, mm -hmm. you know, using ISO 8601 is a really good option. Great. Filters, these are fun. Filters are fun. And this goes back to really what you do in the query string, but there are times where, you know, so big services like Twitter, like Foursquare, like GitHub, like Facebook, they're building APIs, you know, Dan Jacobson said as well, for a large set of unknown developers. That's very different than developing an API for a small set of known developers. Like if you control the server and the client, if you have an internal API or even a partner API, you know, you you can specify you can be much more specific in understanding the use case and tailoring your APIs to fit that. So Netflix is a great example of this. Every device they have, and they work at such scale that it makes sense. Every device they have, uh, they only send it the data that it needs, right? So they've tailored each of their APIs just to fit those devices. Um, whereas on the other hand, you know, Twitter doesn't necessarily know how you're going to use their API. And when you query a Twitter timeline, you get something back that's like 140K worth of data. Mm -hmm. Just to get, you know, What's probably one, that's five one tweet. fields. Yeah, no, that's a timeline, I think. But, but you might be right, is okay. it one tweet? One um, tweet anyway, it's big. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's really nice to be able to have a way in which to limit what's coming back in the response. And that's where filters come in. Uh, you know, there are different ways to do this. Uh, partial response is one that Google popularized. Um, I think Facebook is nice and obvious. It, you just specify the fields you want. Um, they went, if you look at the photos.limit10, that's, uh, you know, that's, if you're working at Facebook scale, consider doing something like that. Uh, but while it's a nice affordance, you know, I think, as a start, don't overcomplicate it. Just being able to pass in the fields in a list is nice. And commas is the right way to separate them. Similarly, when we get to pagination, different patterns here. I think Twitter was first with, they did page and, and uh, you know, RPP 
Remember that? Mm -hmm. Which stands for request per page. Which records is per page. In, records. Oh, yeah. I guess records. Oh, okay, you're probably right, actually. Well, anyway, the fact that we could, that there's so much uncertainty around it, right? That's, yep. that, that says right there, this isn't obvious. LinkedIn has a start and count, which is nice too, pretty good. But we tend to prefer, given that you're building an API for developers, offset and limit, it's just the language that feels most right. But yep. we're not gonna say you're doing it wrong with start and count, but if you had to pick a pattern, go with the Facebook one. Yep. And that's just because it's based off MySQL and Postgres, they all use that language. And it's yeah, pretty well adopted. That interesting question coming in right now is that also, and how do how do people feel about cursors? Is that something that's useful? Uh, you know, it can be. So Twitter is a great example of cursors. You know, when you get back a list of tweets, you know, the Twitter Twitter's a river, right? It's a bunch of streams in a river, and you can't step into that same river twice. Are you writing a folk song right now? <laughs> so what's going on? What would Woody Guthrie say about <laughs> APIs? I don't know. Yeah, we should work on we'll that. look it up. Um, but cursors help you keep your place in that stream, right? So it gives you a way in which to iterate through that because you're going to get back more data than you could possibly process. You need a way to work through the response that you got. Um, and so cursors in that sense make a lot, you know, they make a lot of sense. If you have a system that's changing a lot, cursors are perfect. And you make a lot, you make, without them, with fast moving data, like you're saying, you'll make a lot of mistakes. You'll get, the, you'll get dirty data. Yeah. All right, so uh, the, for the Facebook one, offset and limit, it's a nice pattern. Hypermedia. Mm, I hate this. Yeah, well, I mean, it's good. It's, so it's a nice framework. It's nice to have a framework to talk about, right? And so Martin Fowler famously, this, this is the, it's just the Richardson maturity model. Mm -hmm. he, yeah. So Fowler illustrated it this way. You know, it talks about the glory of rest, and this is really talking back to Fielding's dissertation. You know, we've got, we got the, the resources we've been talking about that. So the swamp of pox, we know we escaped that, this plain old XML. And then resources, you know, there's certainly a level of obviousness. You can see verbs. So right now we're getting resource and verb. Those are your basic building blocks. And then... You know, it's not until you don't you don't get to heaven without hypermedia, mm -hmm. and uh, you know heaven being rest, right? And that that is the constraint. Hypermedia is not an option if you want to rest relate if you want to rest API. But that doesn't mean you need to rest API. You need to consider whether you need to rest API. I mean, I think if your biggest problem is that clients are breaking, hypermedia might be a great fit for you. But if your biggest problem is adoption, trying to get people how to understand and use your API, then you know. Just the fact that you have hypermedia isn't gonna fix that. So make sure that you're not neglecting this level one and level two. Those are the basic building blocks that people need. And then hypermedia is what the machines need on top of that. So hypermedia is great, and there are times even where hypermedia is good for people. So like uh, when you get back, um, you know, we, just to go back to the thing we had a moment ago, a question about cursors. If you get back a list of results from a collection, we, collections need to be paginated so that the clients don't choke when you give them everything, right? And so you paginate your response, and now you know you've got to iterate through it in some way. So you can do that limit and offset. That's good, but you can make it even easier with hypermedia, right? If you have a previous and next that actually does that calculation for you, that's fabulous. That's a case in which hypermedia is making it easier for people and machines. Yeah. So don't focus on hypermedia as your primary problem is all I'm trying to say. Focus on the things that people need in order to be able to understand how to use your API so they can build it, and Hypermedia is a layer on top of that. Let's talk a real quick example of Hypermedia because someone has prompted us to give a simple example. Sure. So an example of an API that doesn't have Hypermedia, let's say, for example, a Twitter status update. You just want to do git on a specific tweet. What's going to come back to you is the name of the person who tweeted it, the actual status message, the timestamp, a bunch of things about that tweet. What won't be there, because it's not a Hypermedia API, there won't be the ability to say, how would you reply to that tweet? How would you retweet that tweet? That would come from a Hypermedia API. So a Hypermedia API version of that would say, give me all that stuff that you already gave me before, but then tell me what are the actions that I can do based on being at that current state. And then it would say, you know, here's how you do an HTTP post to this URL with these parameters in order to uh, you know, reply, or this is the, the HTTP method you use to retweet, the, retweet that. So it's pretty much a Hypermedia API looks a lot like a UI um, from, the, from the web world, right? Yeah. If, I, if, I get a, if I do that same exact request on the Twitter UI, I look at the tweet and the buttons for retweet, or the links I guess they are, for retweet and quote tweet and reply, they're all right there in the UI, right? So you know, because truly the browser is the engine of application state in that sure. case. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, this, the, the server is the client. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. I don't say. So, but you know, what's interesting also is the, the options verb is basically that kind of thing. Options is a verb that says, what can I do with this resource? 
And so it's quite similar in some ways, yep. um, except it's telling you the HTTP verbs, which isn't necessarily giving you the actions and the semantics around that. Um, it also requires another request, and that's not good. So hypermedia basically simplifies that, mm -hmm. and that's one of its benefits. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the work that we do, we use uh, Kevin Swiver's Siren hypermedia standard. So if you guys wanted to see an example of a, a really easy to understand hypermedia format, just Google GitHub Siren, S-I-R-E-N, and you'll see great, great he's got the, the example is right on top. And, and, and he's cool going to be walking through it in the, the learn course. Yeah, we do. You know, that's a great course. thing to come yeah. and check out. Yeah. And if you if you look at that, why we love using it is he's also built a Siren browser, so you can you can using a UI you can browse through and make requests on that API without needing any out of band documentation or anything. So there are benefits for for hypermedia. Okay. So you know one complication of hypermedia is that it, it makes your responses bigger, right? And so if you have to give links back all the time, that becomes a bit wasted. So you can see pattern I like from, oh, you, you're actually Googling it? There's that link. Uh, all right, so Facebook's got a really interesting pattern here. So instead of, I was gonna say polluting, is that too pejorative? Um, <laughs> instead of polluting their responses. The river, they're polluting the river? Of, yeah, that's right. <laughs> too, many, too many metaphors. <laughs> this is but a you can, see, you can see here's their metadata. So they have the, an entire element for metadata. And they get this by adding in a query parameter, again, affecting the response, sort of the nuanced controls over the, of the, over the resource. Um, that where you pass in if metadata equals true as in the query string, you will get back all of the connections for this for the entity that you're looking at. That's that that is hypermedia. And and mm -hmm. it makes sense because they've got a graph API. And if you want to be able to walk the graph API, you need to understand the connections of this entity to all the other entities. There are a lot of entities in the Facebook universe. And so you get a lot of data back, right? Because of all the possible things you could do from here. Um, that's cool. Uh, but what I like is that you opt into it. Mm -hmm. If you want those connections, you say metadata true. And if you don't, and so you know, you could decide to have a way in which to inhibit the metadata. Yep. The metadata. Yeah. And and then you've seen, you know, in a mobile world, you do still need to think about, you know, our and bandwidth isn't some extent, isn't super yeah. rich, right? And so we still need ways in which to control the size of the response. Um, and this is one way to do it. Right. So a bunch of questions just came up about the various hypermedia standards, and we'll just say there's a there are at least six pretty well established hypermedia standards. Uh, we're not going to go into the trade-offs of which one's better than the other. I'm just speaking to the ones that we use on a daily basis, so I, I know Siren. But PAL Collections, JSON, Mason, Hydra, there's a bunch of great ones out there. And like I said, if you're really curious about that stuff, either check out both the API Craft Google group. There's always great discussions about the various formats. And uh, tune in to that API Craft conference. We're going to have all six of those uh, hypermedia authors together on one panel to talk about that. Errors are quite possibly the most important thing you can do in API design. Because yes. you should expect that people say that are going one more to, time. <laughs> how you handle errors, things are going to go wrong. People are going to learn, need to learn from their mistakes. They don't yet know how to get the thing they want, and figuring out how to handle those error cases is super important. How do you give people the information they need? It's one of the strangest things to convince people because all of us that are developers, we all yeah. write code error first. We everything we do, we just go in headlong. We try to write code, and when it fails, we read the message and then we fix it. That's how everybody writes code. But when it comes to providing an API. Many of us don't think about that experience that we have every day. Yeah. It's the weirdest lack of empathy <laughs> of true. any group of professionals yeah. on the planet. Yeah. Right? So we, unfortunately, we have the slide toward the end here, but thinking about how your errors work is the number one thing that you should do when designing a really good API because that's the first experience your developers are going to have trying to use it. And it's a key piece of talking about RV, right? Because we're talking about designing for adoption right. and how do you make things obvious. And so understanding that part of learning is failing what are you going to do to help people when they fail? Absolutely. Um, so you know, I think you know, so we can pick on it. it. Amazon Web Services for a moment, their S3 storage service. You know, look. So keep in mind, this is from 2006, mm -hmm. but you can see it's highlighted in the, in the here in the slide. The error response is embedded in the 200 OK response. Yeah. So Facebook, this is example Facebook, do the same thing. Facebook yeah. do the same thing because the. All the games that were built on the Facebook API that ran in Flash, if you sent back anything other than a 200 to Flash, Flash would explode. Right. So they needed a way yeah. to handle that. So what they did is they said, no matter what happens, everything's going to be HTTP OK, and we'll put the error code in the results. And it was, oh, it's horrible. I think they were going to fix it now, but it was terrible. And, and you know, so I'm so glad we've outgrown that. Yep. But you know, that obviously, you know, it's easy to look at the giant mistakes of the past, but this is the worst one I know of. Right. Uh, and, and part of the reason why is that you know, 200 can be cached. So now your cache is full of an error. <laughs> you know that's just a great example of how you can get it completely wrong. Yep. Um, so let's look at some. You know how, how somebody got it really right. So I highly recommend, and when we post the slides, we'll make sure the link to this posted is up on there. Uh, but Box, 
was as thoughtful as anybody I've seen. More than Twilio? Yes. Oh wow, okay. Yes, no, Box is fantastic. Cool. So, and not only did they do, they do a great job of explaining the error response, they also talk through the process and how they, the, the design process they went through in arriving at this. Excellent. So um, quite possibly the best post I've read ever about handling errors in the APIs. Awesome. There's so much good stuff in here for people. So it's managed to do, now that's the real problem, remember, is we're building something for machines and people both. And you need to figure out how to handle both of those. You know, the audience, once you've got a production app, is the machine, really. Yeah. It's enabling human interactions, ideally. Yeah. But it's put in place by people and, and that's why adoption matters. That's why obviousness matters. You know, a little bit more on errors there, because right. there's, some, there's some discussion there about which errors mm -hmm. codes to use. For me, you, you can really go deep into studying the, all the HTTP semantics around errors, and you probably should, but if you needed a simple shorthand, there's three possible things that can happen, kind of. One, everything is okay. That's the 200 family, right? It's 200, it's 201. We're good. That's one. The second type of thing that happened is, we, the API provider, we messed up. Something came. Something was wrong on the server. That's in the 500 family, and then the other bit is the last thing is something the developer did something wrong. Yes. Like they looked for an address that just doesn't exist. That was on their that their fault, and that's the 400. So well, that one in particular is a 404. Right. 404. The, the resource doesn't exist. Everyone yeah. sees this on the web. Right. Right. So those are the three big buckets. If you had to just pick three error codes, you do 200, 400, and 500, and you can get a lot more nuance than that. But that's that's the overall idea. Yep. Um, we've talked about this a lot. We've got a bunch of materials, ebooks, and things that if you if you want to get, we get into this in much more detail than we can on this call. Right. Um, but or oh, sorry, webcast. Okay. Sorry. All right. A few more items here towards the end. But SDKs. Do you need SDKs? Of course. Yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> right. So think about your audience. Right. So if you're building an API whose primary audience is mobile developers. Mobile developers, they're little islands of developers, right? So you've got those building for Android, those building for iOS. They expect to have an SDK mm -hmm. because they, you know, they live entirely in that language. Um, and that's fine. Uh, but you know, SDK, I think of SDKs as like a last mile problem. Your, your goal is to build something general purpose that gets the data close. And then SDKs can help it get it a little bit closer, right? It's, uh, it's nice if people are familiar with the conventions and idioms of a particular language to be able to meet them on their terms with a well-designed SDK. But the problem is, now you've got another thing to document. And if for every language you add, you've got one more thing to document and maintain. So there's definite, there's burden to maintaining these things, but uh, you know sometimes it's worth it and you need to decide. In terms of developer adoption, as much as I love APIs and messing around with HTTP, if I'm trying to get from point A to point P to build a project, I want the SDK and I'll use it every time, even if it's buggy, because it can get me down the road faster. So the ideal, why, so why spend so much time thinking about API design? Because what you want is you want the people who are building those SDKs to be as productive as possible yep. with your API. But for me, the SDKs, they're, they're magic. It's, it, it just, as soon as you have an SDK, you have a whole developer audience on Android, on iOS, on JavaScript, all opened up to you. And, uh, but your support burden's gonna go up. Too. Support burden's gonna go up, but you know what? your addressable market will also go up yeah. too. So, so it's like, But it's a trade-off, right? You, you, you have to decide, just like adding a feature. It's a trade-off only because it's a return on investment trade-off, right? There are gonna be some resources into it, sure. but assuming, assume infinite resources, it's not, it's oh. never a, a bad thing to do. <laughs> I'd love to have infinite resources. Okay, yeah. Great. All right. Yeah, um, And Maybe then, we're, you know, we're I'll put, against, we're running up against running the clock here, Marsh. Uh, but, you know, with, when you do SDKs, you're also gonna have to deal with things like back off. And so that's a, actually, a, a, that's a nice feature of an SDK. If you do back off right, it means the developer doesn't have to think about it. It's one more thing that you can make easier for them. Yep. Um, another, another, and the reason why I put JavaScript on here, other than it's the you know, lingua franca of the web. Mm -hmm. um, it's the broken English of the web. It's the French. Go ahead. What? Okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but JavaScript, like, the web is a view source world. And so it's difficult to do things like getting an OAuth token when you can view the source. Right? Yep. And so having a JavaScript API is a way to wrap that and make it easier for developers without having to give away their secrets. Right? Yep. So, all right, most launch important something. thing is to launch, right, exactly. Perfect is the enemy of done. This isn't about building the world's most perfect API. If you're letting things like hypermedia slow you down from building and understanding the service you're trying to create, mm -hmm. then you're doing it wrong. You're much better off trying to figure out how to build something that will be useful to people that can and who can easily understand how to use it. So keep it simple, focus on the basics. Hypermedia may be a great fit for you, but focus first on keeping it simple. So we, we've got some of these principles we're pulling together in a GitHub repository. 
It's app, github.com slash, we'll put this on the, in the yeah, slides as well. Github.com slash absolutely slash RV. That's where it will be. So it's just this outline right now. We're going to make it look more principled than that. Cool. On that page, we have our general philosophy where we have just ideas about what RV, sort of the intellectual framework behind the decisions that we make. That's up there. And, it, and that comes from you know watching our customers suffer through these problems from our own you mm -hmm. know we're an API driven company mm -hmm. you know we have these problems every day Plus all we, the time we built API consoles on top of every major API in yeah. the world right so, so, so we've seen a suffer lot through a of lot these of patterns as, yeah. and and this is uh, you know this is if you boil it down these things are important great so uh, if you would like to reach out to us you can hit us on Twitter at resource verb. Marsh and I are landlessness and Earth to Marsh. You can also, I highly recommend for discussions like this, there's been some great discussion in the chat window that we just won't have a chance to dive into, but those kind of conversations are fantastic to have on the API Craft Google group. A lot of smart folks out there. So no shortage of opinions. Yep, please join there, have those kind of conversations there to keep the, keep the dialogue running. Uh, thank you much for uh, tuning in. Check out our webcast on YouTube at Apogee and join that Google group. And we're on SlideShare. And These slides will be slow. up there. This video will be up there. That'll be you can, up there. Yep. You can look at it later. Uh, slow it down. Slow motion actually is probably yeah. best. Right. And uh, check if you're really curious about that hypermedia stuff. Check out the the panel at the upcoming API Craft conference. That's going to be a great time. This can be a lot of fun talking about APIs. Yep. All right. See you Thanks next time. Everyone. Bye.